Amen. Hey, let's give it up for the chapel band as you guys find your way back to your seats. Man, that was awesome, y'all. Thank you, guys. Man, I'm loving what I'm seeing from the middle school this morning. You know, I was driving over here, and I was feeling a little tired, and I was like, man, these students are going to be asleep, but we got people singing SpongeBob SquarePants theme song all the way back there. We got people repping the Atlanta Braves. I see some Braves jerseys. We're in Braves country here in Mount Perrin. I'm going to be honest, I'm a little worried about the Dodgers. Are you worried about the Dodgers, or are you feeling confident? Y'all aren't worried? Man, I'm loving that energy. I'll be honest, so I went to school in Southern California, and so I have a lot of friends who are Dodger fans, and last year was hard for me. Blowing a 3-1 lead, they gave me a lot of grief, and so, man, hope this is the year for the Braves. But hey, I'm so excited to be here, and um, like Mr. Kyle said, my name is Chris. Uh, I lead in our high school ministry at Passion City Church. So the closest location for you guys is we have a campus right down near the Braves Stadium. So go Braves. And so if you ever need a church to belong to, we would love for you to be a part. I wanted to introduce myself. So I wanted, since we're speaking to the middle school today, I wanted to show a picture of what I looked like in middle school. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the referee, <laughs> not the referee. Uh, I'm also not the huge kid. I'm not the uh, 6'2", like 225 kid that like probably destroyed me in this basketball game. I'm the nice 5'6", let's be generous and say like 95 pound kid wearing a mouthpiece who's just trying not to get his teeth beaten in in this basketball game. So that's what I looked like when I was your age. So if you're the 5'6", kid, there's hope. There's hope today that you might be able to grow, but that's what I look like in middle school. But I'm so excited to be here and really believe that today that God wants to speak to you, that you, in your situation and whatever you're walking through, whatever you got going on, that God wants to meet with you into your situation. He wants to speak. So let's pray again that God would do that. Lord, thank you. Thank you for a day where we can Move everything aside. We can move the stresses of school aside. We can move all of the things in life aside, Lord, and we can just turn our attention, our focus, our gaze to you, Jesus. So Mount Perrin, would you even pray? You, right there in your seat, would you just pray that God would speak to you? And just ask God, would you speak to me? Would you show me more who you are today? So Jesus, we love you. Use this time, set our minds' attention on you, stir our hearts' affection, and then send our hands into action, Lord. Use this time for your glory, for your name, in Jesus' name, amen. So I want to start by telling a story about one of the worst first dates I've ever had. Yes, a little honesty to start the morning. It was my senior year of high school, and I asked out a girl in my physics class, um, and I was like, all right, hey, what do you want to do? I came up with this idea. It was like winter time, so I was like, best idea ever. Nothing ro more romantic than ice skating. And I was like, okay, this is going to be amazing. It's going to be the best date ever. And again, like I intro, it is, was not the best date ever. And it wasn't her fault. It wasn't like, oh, man, we just didn't connect. She wasn't great communication-wise. We just didn't match. No, wasn't my fault. Wasn't my you know, personality or inability to hold the conversation, it was the date's idea's fault. The idea that ice skating was the problem, that I had chosen to go ice skating because we were on this date, and the whole time, we, like, couldn't even talk because, like, I kind of significantly overestimated my ice skating abilities, and apparently she was, like, grew up doing ice doing it. She was amazing at ice skating. So it'd be like every 10 seconds, we'd be like, oh, so how is your family? Ah! And then I would just like eat it. And that was pretty much the date for a whole hour where like we would try to start having a conversation and then I would like get the wobbles and then be like fall and then she would laugh at me and then I would be like, stop laughing, it hurts. Um, and it was like the worst date ever. Why? Because first impressions matter. And we didn't get a second one, partly on me, because I didn't make a great first impression. Because I went into the date being like, man, I want to show her that, you know, I've got this personality that I can hold the conversation. Maybe she'll think like, man, he's so athletic, going across that ice. But what's the real first impression that I made? 
not great. She saw me just on my face over and over and over again. And she's like, I ain't dating this guy. This guy's a fool. And there wasn't a second date. So why do I tell this story? Not just to embarrass myself, but I tell this story because first impressions communicate something. In this case, I didn't communicate what I wanted to communicate, and there was only one date, and it was the worst first date of my life. But first impressions communicate something. And what I want to talk about today is one of God's first impressions to humanity. Up to this point, the book of Genesis has happened. He's been interacting with history. But to this point, we get the most clear first impression from God where he describes who he is. Throughout the book of Genesis, throughout the Exodus, we had seen God act and he has spoken before. But in this text that we're talking about, God makes a first impression, a much better first impression than I made. But he makes a first impression. He tells us who he is. And this matters for us this morning because you're in a time of life, in middle school, when you're going to have to start deciding, man, who do I believe God to be? It's not going to be your parents' faith anymore. You're getting to the age. You're having your own thoughts. You're, you're figuring out, man, what do I think? It's not going to be Mr. Kyle's thoughts about God. It's not going to be Mount Perrin's thoughts about God. You are getting to the age where you have to start deciding, man, what do I believe? Who do I believe God to be? And in this text, God is leaving a first impression saying, hey, guys, this is who I'm like. A.W. Tozer has an amazing quote. It's kind of our big idea today. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Think about that. What comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Not the sport that we play, not how good our grades are, not what college we might go to one day, or any of the things we care about. Tozer is saying, no, what you think, what I think, what we all think about God is the most important thing about us. Because what we believe about God will determine the quality and direction of our life. What we believe about God will determine where we go. So that's the big idea today, that what you believe about God is the most important thing about you. So we need to figure out who is God? Who does God reveal himself to be? So we're going to be in Exodus 34. We're just going to look at five, uh, three verses, five through seven. And up to this point, again, God is making a first impression. He is, Moses is up on Mount Sinai and Moses wants to see a bit of God's glory. And God passes by Moses. And this is when God lets us know who he is. So I'm going to read it. I love that some of y'all have your Bibles. That's amazing. But starting in verse 5, Exodus 34, verse 5, then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. He does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of their parents of the third and fourth generation. So you see that? That's kind of like God's Instagram bio in a sense. Maybe y'all don't have Instagram yet, but people will communicate the most important things about them and their priorities in their Instagram bio. Like, Oh, I'm a University of Georgia football fan. Oh, I go to Mount Perrin Christian School. I play on the football team. I do this. I play volleyball. I do that. And God's like, hey, Moses, I'm going to pass by, and let me tell you who I am. Let me tell you the most important things about me. And I think it reveals who God is. And the first thing that we see when God passes by Moses and he says these things is that we see that God is revealing that God is good. You see that? Look at all these adjectives that he says. Look, here's what I want you to know about me. I'm compassionate. I'm gracious. I'm slow to anger. 
I abound in love and faithfulness, and I maintain love to thousands and forgive the wickedness and rebellion of sin. He's merciful. He's good. He's gracious. God, the first thing he wants you to know about him, his first impression, the thing he wants to get across is that he is good, that he loves you, that he's good, he's gracious. And that's pretty awesome. Think about it. This is God the self-existent being, the one who was never created, who's always been and always will be, the God that has been here for all eternity, that spoke creation into, in, into being with just a word, that God, he doesn't even lead with that. I mean, he could have said, hey, Moses, here's what you need to know about me. I'm holy, I'm good, I'm powerful, so bow down. And guess what? God talks that way sometimes because he is that. But he's saying, look, first impression, here's what I want you to get. I'm good. I'm loving. I'm gracious. I'm merciful. That's what he wants you to get as his first impression. There's a saying you've probably heard before that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And it's talking about political leaders and world leaders throughout history that when human beings like us get power, Unlimited power corrupts our heart, but God is the opposite. He is all powerful. And yet, when He reveals Himself, He goes, Nope, not corrupted, fully good. That is my nature. I am loving. I am kind. I am gracious. And that's what we need to know about God. I was thinking about it on the way over about just how your parents love you. Have you ever thought about that? Why do your parents love you? Have you ever thought about that? It's like, did they start loving you when you got to this age? Where like you're getting to the age where you guys can have like good conversations now and maybe your parents like going to maybe like your sporting events or like to your theater shows or, or your concerts or whatever. Did they just start loving you in the last year or so now that you're able to like have good conversations and you're, you know, you can have good stuff to relate on? No. They loved you when you were a baby. Anyone have younger siblings or maybe cousins that are babies? All they do is poop and cry and eat. And they sometimes sleep. Sometimes. Babies don't contribute anything. But every parent in the room would tell you that when they held their child for the first time, when your parents held you, they felt like a crazy amount of love in their heart before you had anything to offer. You can't have a meaningful dialogue with a baby. It's just a baby. It throws up, and you're like, I love you, and it's like, Bleh. like that's, that's what babies do. That, you did not like that I just made that noise. I'm sorry. I want to apologize. Uh, you're like, but babies have nothing to offer, but why do parents love, why do your parents love you when you were a baby? They love you because they loved you. It's not counterintuitive. They just loved you. They held you, and they're like, I don't know why, but I love this child. And that's how God is, that he created you. And so when he looks at you, he just loves you so, so much. And the reality is, I think everyone in the room has heard that. You could fill it out on a test. You could go write an essay about it. But in your everyday life, you feel like you have to earn God's love. A lot of relationships on earth, you feel like you have to earn the love of God, right? Or not the, earn the love of other people. I got to do this so they think about me this way. And it's easy to think about God that way. But what we see in this text, in God's very first, first impression, what he wants us to know about him, is that he is love. Before you do anything, he loves you. He loves you because that is who he is. God is good. And some of you feel like you have to earn that love. And God's like, no, just receive it. He loved you before you even responded to him. The second thing we see, though, is that God is just. You see, a lot of people, they don't talk about this. They talk about God as love, and that's amazing because that is so true. But you see that after they talk about, hey, God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, and merciful. It says in verse 7, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. 
And so the reality about God is that he hates sin. And sin is anything where we disobey God, when we have gone our own way and said, in rebellion of God, I'm going to go my own way, I'm going to do what I want to do, and we've rebelled against God. It's hatred towards God. That is what sin is. And God is saying, hey, I'm going to let you know, in my character, I can't leave the guilty unpunished. Sin needs to be paid for. And if I can be honest, I think sometimes we get sold a, a cheap gospel, a false gospel, and the false gospel is God loves you. You heard that before? God loves you. It's true, but it's not the full picture. The full picture is that you, me, all of us, we have fallen short of the glory of God. We are the guilty, and God can't leave the guilty unpunished. We have sinned. We have gone our own way. And the full gospel is that we were, uh, we were in sin. We were far off, and yet God, this is amazing. God loved us so much that he entered the brokenness, that he took the sin, the sin that he says that he hates so much, he said, yep, I'll take that and I'll put it on my own shoulders. And he took all of our sin and put it on his own shoulders on a cross and paid for your sin and my sin. The sin that he hates went on his shoulders. The innocent became guilty so that the guilty could become innocent. Do you see that? That is good news. That is the full gospel. It's not just like, hey, God loves you because you're so amazing. It's like, no, God loves you even in our brokenness, even though we are far off, that he made a way in the person of Jesus. And if you believe that, again, what you think about God is the most important thing about you. If you really believe that, not just in your head, but in your heart, that'll change some things. Because if I know that God hates sin, and I claim to love God, that man, I want to get the sin out of my life so I can honor the God that I love. You see that? So what are some of the things in your life that maybe you've gotten a little casual with? Some things that you know maybe aren't the most pleasing to God, that you kind of just tolerated and said, maybe it's not that big of a deal. Oh, I prayed that prayer in the sixth grade, and I'm saved so I can go do whatever I want. No, God, if we love God, we want to, and he hates sin, and I want to get sin out of my life because I know I want to follow him. And so this is who God reveals himself to be. He's a God of love, and he's a God of justice. Anyone seen Chronicles of Narnia in the place? Anyone, anyone seen Chronicles of Narnia? I love this line in Lion, the Witch, in the Wardrobe. Susan, um, so there's four kids that go to a place called Narnia, and they hear about Aslan. And C.S. Lewis writes Aslan to be um, an, an allegory for Christ. And Susan is asking about Aslan. And it's like, and, and he, she finds out that Aslan is a lion. And Susan goes, oh, I thought Aslan was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And then Mr. Beaver, because there's talking beavers in Narnia, say, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And that's who God is revealing himself to be in this text. This first impression, and this is so important because what we think about God is the most important thing about us. It's the most important decision you'll ever make about who you believe God to be. And he's saying, yeah, I'm not safe. I'm powerful. I'm holy. And guess what? I don't love sin. So he's not safe, but he's good. And he loves you, and he cares about you. And maybe you're in the place wondering, like, okay, I know the text says that, but how else can I know that that's true, that, that God is just and God is loving? And I would point us to the cross where these two things became reality where God's justice and God's love merged into one. On the cross, Jesus, who is God, took all of the sin on himself. So he kept his justice. The guilty 
or the, our sin which made us guilty, he said, hey, I'll pay the price. And he satisfied the justice of God so that he could be merciful and gracious and live up to what he was saying when he says, I maintain love to thousands and I forgive wickedness, rebellion, and sin. The way that he can do that isn't just because he said it right here, but because he showed it on a cross. And he took on all the sin and he died on a cross and then rose three days later to prove that he had paid for all the sin that was on our shoulders. So I'm going to close with this story about how we can know that this is really who God is. There's a movie called The Quiet Place. Has anyone seen The Quiet Place? It's like a middle school movie. Oh, wow, more people than I thought. I'll explain it for those who haven't seen it. I'm not a scary movie guy. I'm not. It's like a thriller, so it's like I was able to watch it. So like, even if you don't like scary movies, it's like kind of a thriller. There's a monster who... Uh, is attracted to sound. So like if I made any noise, the monster would come and uh, it wouldn't be great for me. I'd probably get killed by the monster. That's the premise of the movie. So most of the population has been wiped out by this scary monster that's attracted to sound. And so there's a family that, is, that are living pretty much in quiet um, and they, you know, they whisper and stuff so the, the, the monster won't see them. And it gets to the, the climax of the movie and it's so beautiful. John Krasinski, Jim in the office, if you watch that show, um, let's go. John Krasinski, he s- walks up and he sees that his daughter and his son are in this truck. And the monster is just on top of them, like trying to get in the truck and kill him. And it's just a matter of time before he breaks through the truck. And so John Krasinski walks up and sees his son and his daughter in danger. And John Krasinski knows what he needs to do. Because that truck is making noise, so he needs to get the monster away from them so the truck can drive to safety. So John Krasinski looks at his daughter, and his daughter's deaf, and so they know sign language, and he says something so powerful. He looks at her and says, he says, I love you, looking at his daughter. And he says, I have always loved you. And he's looking at his daughter, and his daughter knows what he's about to do. And at that pivotal moment, at the climax of the movie, he lets out a scream. The monster turns to him, and John Krasinski gives his life so that the son and the daughter can drive to safety. And so my question is, do you think that daughter would ever question if God loved her? You think so? No, he would look back and be like, she would look back and be like, I mean, my dad loved me. He loved me so much that he died for me. He said, I have loved you. I have always loved you. And then he proved it by giving his life so the daughter and the son could go free. And that is true of our God. He doesn't just say it. He doesn't just say, hey, I love you guys. Oh, he doesn't just say, I'm compassionate and merciful. But like John Krasinski, he proves it in his son Jesus who dies in our place. And if you believe that, man, that changes everything. What you believe about God, most important decision you'll ever make. If you believe that, not just in your head, but allow it to transform your heart, man, that'll change the game for you. That God in heaven, the eternal God, would die for you in your place. Changes everything. I'm gonna pray. And we'll close. Jesus, thank you. Lord, thank you that we don't have a God who just tells us things. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it's true. But Lord, more than that, you show it to us. You show these students that you love them. 2,000 years ago on a cross where you took what you hate, which is sin, because you're a God of justice, and you took it on your shoulders because you love these students. So Lord, I pray for whatever they're walking through. I know there's students in here who don't really believe that. If they're being honest, they look back and they maybe believe the idea of it, but they don't believe that they're worthy of love. Would they recognize, God, that you love them, that you care for them right where they're at? And Lord, would they trust you with their lives? Would they say, God, I believe in you? And, and would, they, would that truth permeate and transform their lives? 
in Jesus' name. Amen.